Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming to the very last <laughs> presentation. I'm glad some people showed up. At least you'll be around for the, uh, the prizes. Uh, I'm from Austin, Texas. And uh, back, I was here back uh, earlier this year in July, right after the Brexit vote, the weekend after the Brexit vote. So we were talking about Texit. <laughs> Literally, Texas was a country for 10 years, if you didn't know that, and so we have that mindset uh, <laughs> in Texas. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to cover just a minute uh, what, what we'll go over. I'd like to give you a brief history about how I got involved in SDR and how the company came to be, and then talk about where we are today, Flex Radio, what we're doing today, and how that might apply to things that you're interested in and then give you a very tiny peek at what's next. I can't tell you everything, but I can give you some directional ideas of what's going on. I mentioned that we were here in July of this year, and we donated a Maestro and a Flex 6500 to the NRC. If any of you go to the Bletchley Park, you can actually go operate this station. And so I've talked to people here that have been there. That was a lot of fun. We had a quick tour. Now, I do want to show you the guy on the right. He kind of looks like me. He's my son, Matt. And he plays into this story in a few minutes. So he's KD5FGE. If you call Flex Radio, you're likely to get Matt because he handles all of our sales now. Um, and I'll tell you how that came about. Now, how many of you remember when you first discovered radio? Do you remember that? It's an emotional experience. It was for me. I had that kind of excitement. It was magic. The first time I ever heard ham radio was purely magic. I don't have time to tell you the whole story. But I will tell you that probably in around 1965, somebody gave me a World War II transceiver. And I didn't have any tools except a pair of pliers, but I could twist the wires and pull all the resistors and all those things out. So I pulled every part out of that, that radio, and I was totally fascinated with the parts. And uh, I sorted them into those exact boxes. Those boxes are in my attic today. I took that picture a few months ago. And they still have some of those parts, as well as some newer parts. Now, that was where my magic began. And I started getting into ham radio and got my license in 1967 as a novice. And that was responsible for me going into electrical engineering and ended up spending a career in the uh, computer and technology uh, industry and started businesses and built businesses in that that industry but I didn't get to do much engineering so after having run a, a public company in the mid 90s I left there and my son was uh, Matt was about I think 12 years old at the time and I took him to field day there in Austin and he said Wow, wow, Dad, would you help me study and get a license? Now, what dad that's a ham doesn't appreciate that, right? <laughs> and I think it was he just wanted some dad time. And so we did that. And he got his, his novice license, and it got me back into ham radio because as many of us do, life happens and, you know, you have to raise kids and all those things, and so we get a bit away from ham radio. But I got back in 1997. So at the time, PSK-31 had started to become popular. I'm sure some of you can remember when that occurred. And so I remembered some things I had in college. I hadn't been doing engineer, engineering since I just got out of college. And I said, I bet I could build a radio with a PC and a sound card because I saw what they were doing with, PC, with uh, PSK-31. And I could take something called in-phase and quadrature, which is what you do with a direct conversion receiver. You go directly down in one step from RF to audio. and Direct, direct conversion's been around uh, since before super hats, I believe. Um, and so you can take that technology and run that into the, the left and right channels of a sound card and then write some software, and I'll have a radio. Well, little did I know that would take me four years to do because I hadn't done engineering and I had forgotten all the mathematics that I learned in college, as I'm sure you can appreciate. But uh, over a period of four years, I started building some hardware uh, using something, um, uh, quadrature downsampling converter, QSD, and uh, started building some prototypes, as you see across there, and, 
In late 2002, I had the board set that you see on the bottom. I had, it had taken me a lot of work to get to that point in relearning mathematics and how radios work and so forth because I'd been over in the computer industry all this time. I had not been doing RF since my early years. So I wrote a series of articles for QEX magazine published by the ARRL. It's the technical magazine in the U.S. And I, uh, I wrote these four articles. And I did that because I found it so hard to dig out. Uh, and I called it, uh, originally called it SDR for dummies, and they didn't like that because that title was already taken. So I, they, we called it a software-defined radio for the masses. And you can go download load these articles off of the ARRL site or uh, our website if you're interested in reading them. But it was a story of my journey. Now, I didn't start out to start a company. I started out just to have fun. So I spent about th those four years having fun. And then uh, I received hundreds of emails from all over the world, including your country and other countries, uh, saying, I'm really interested in this technology. Could you somehow make it available? It's gotten me re-excited about the hobby. I'd gotten out of it. It's gotten me enthusiastic again about the hobby. Could you make those available? And so I said, well, maybe. I've been starting companies all my life. I guess I could start another one. I had a business that had kind of gone away with the 2001-2002 uh, recession. And so I, so I said, well, let me build 10 board sets. And I, you'll need to send me an email and tell me what your career background is. And I'd like to know why you'd like to have these boards, why you should get one of those board sets and the software. And, and I got fi 50 orders instead of 10. <laughs> And I got 500 orders the first year uh, and started building these with my kids coming home from college on the kitchen table. And over the period of uh, the first few years, sold over 2,000 of what I would call a prototype today. That, those three board sets with the heart. And this is, how many of you heard of Power SDR? Okay, most everybody in the room. That's the original version of Power SDR written in my house in 1999, 2003, 2003. It started probably in 99 or 2000. It was called SDR Console at that, at that time. So it's evolved a lot since then. Um, you'll see that what, what I did, you see that three board stack became a five board stack there. We kept adding on pieces to it to add more performance, pre-selectors, that's a two meter transverter on the top. And you'll see it needed a 100 watt amplifier and an antenna tuner, that's it over the right. And then it needed a box. It started out just as those three boards. So over time it evolved into a complete system. And there are people still on the air with those today. But the shipment started in uh, 2003. And uh, this is what the uh, development lab looked like in 2004. Uh, my hair was not quite as white then as it is now. Um, and so that was doing, so I was actually doing software development in those days. And then around, along around 2007, uh, it evolved a little bit. And here's uh, working on the uh, Flex 5000. That's actual artwork for the 5000. These are the boards over here and test equipment there. That's the Flex 5000 in development. Over time, the family grew from the 5,000, then we built the 3,000, then the 1,500. The 1,500 is still in production today. That's been a very popular little rig uh, for many applications, including just getting started in SDR, as well as building transverter-based systems, et cetera. Then uh, Power SDR uh, was, uh, open is open source. And because it was open source, many people had picked it up and used it for other things. Everything from soft rocks, you've probably heard of those, to uh, HPSDR and others. Um, the, 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 uh, the only problem with uh, open source was we were doing, spending money paying engineers to do development and our competitors would use that development. And so that made it a little bit hard to build a commercial business. Now, evolving from there, we got, uh, we were asked by uh, the U.S. government to bid on a couple of contracts, and we won some contracts. And this plays into where we are today because the board, the PCI Express card, is a direct sampling receiver with 16 receivers on that one card can all stream to the PC. 
all at once. And we built that using a chip that was hand tested by analog devices engineers. We were that early in the process. The AD9467, that chip is now used in the Flex 6000 series. And so we started with it, uh, that was eight years ago, starting working with that in the government. The, uh, the box on the upper right is, the, is 32 copies of a Flex 5000. There are 32 Flex 5000 receivers. Each one of those slots is a Flex 5000. And there's an Ethernet port over there that all 36 of those can stream to the Ethernet port. They are phase synchronous tuning. In, in other words, every single one of those tunes phase synchronously. And there are probably a few of those somewhere in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> you might know, you can probably find them on Google Earth, you know, somewhere, in other places. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to comment. <laughs> so anyway, the, uh, down here is a 24-channel uh, L-band microwave receiver for satellites on, in a single 1U rack that can all stream through 64 megahertz wide receivers and stream to four 10 gigabit ethernet ports. So you can see that's a long way from the SDR 1000. And this was 2008 through 2010. Now the reason I show you this slide is because uh, this technology is what we took and we, put, we took out a clean sheet of paper and we said that we did something that's rarely done in technology companies. You rarely start over. You always have, tend to evolve and work with the legacy you've had. We started over with that clean sheet of paper. We didn't use a single code line of PowerSDR, not one. We didn't use a single circuit out of the, the earlier products. We started clean. We did use what we developed for the government and started from there and developed the 6000 series because we wanted to build a, a family of products that was ready for the future. And I'll talk about what three things are important to that. So there's now the 6700, the 6500, and the 6300 in the Flex 6000 series. These are all direct sampling um, radios. And I'll talk about what that means in a minute. We believe there are three things that change everything in ham radio. One is SDR. And not just in ham radio, but in the, the entire world. Your phone is an SDR with several radios in it. It's amazing and a very high-end computer in your phone. But SDR changes everything. Secondly, we believe direct sampling changes everything. And I'll talk about what, why. And then the radio is a server, an RF server. That's the third thing. Now, how many of you know when, uh, you know who this guy is? Armstrong, yeah. He invented the, Anybody know what year? I think I heard it somewhere. 18, 1918. Yeah, we're coming, at, we're at 98 years now since the Superhead was invented, believe it or not. So it's been around a good while. Um, the, uh, now, it's evolved. Now, it, we've added DSP on the back end, right? Uh, I think that was the 80s maybe when DSP came in on the back end, and it's evolved in what it does. And we've added roofing filters and more knobs and different, we've added some small displays to it and so forth, but it's still a super hat, it, super hat technology. So we think Mr. Armstrong has had a pretty good run. <laughs> you know, 98 years is not bad. And his architectures never go away, they just move to software. So let's take a look at a typical superhead. This is an up conversion radio where we're going to up convert 64 to 64 megahertz. And then we're going to down convert to 455 kilohertz and then down convert again to, it's hard to read that, isn't it? I can't read it. 30 kilo, 36 kilohertz. So actually this radio has a 36 kilohertz IF, which is just above the audio spectrum, and it can use audio type analog to digital converters. Now what happens at each of these conversions, we have analog circuits. We have mixers and IF uh, amplifiers and filters, right? And we have crystal filters. Though each of those things are analog devices which are not, it's not possible to make perfect. And so they have distortion 
and they add noise to the circuitry. So let's take a look at another one. I mentioned direct conversion. Now direct conversion has been around a long time. In this case, we're going to take a quadrature, uh, we're going to take two mixers and we're going to mix the same signal down to uh, audio frequencies, uh, DCIF or zero frequency IF in the audio spectrum and then we can use a very high performance audio A to D converter like you would use in a sound recording studio. That's how the SDR-1000 worked, that's how the 5000, the 3000, and the 1500 all work. They're direct conversion down to a DCIF. And so we're going to use a very high performance converter and we can take up to 192 kilohertz of spectrum. You've seen Power SDR, you can get up to 192 kilohertz of spectrum uh, for a spectrum display. And then we can use uh, uh, an IF off of that and do signal processing. So this is an, another way that SDR is done. Now the, the third way and the most powerful way is direct sampling. In this case, uh, we, have a two, uh, we have an A to D converter with a clock running at 245.76 megahertz or mega samples per second. Now what that means is I can actually sample the entire HF through VHF spectrum all at once. And I can then pick, uh, pick signals out of that, many signals at once even. Um, now, we still have mixers and amplifiers and other things, but they're all done mathematically in the digital signal processing. For instance, a mixer is a multiplier. If I multiply A times B, I mix the two signals. So that, uh, if you can multiply, you can create a mixer. Um, so that's how we do it in direct sampling. Um, now, we, if you have a digital multimeter, you actually have a sampling device. It's going to sample a digital voltage at a point in time and to give you a measurement on it. Well, what if I have a sine wave and you can see each of the vertical, the little black dots or points at which I'm going to take that voltmeter and measure the signal on the antenna. Think of it that way. And every time I measure the signal on the antenna, I get a voltage. I don't care about the power, I care about the voltage, actually. So that's, that's the basics of your, you're taking a digital measurement, and you're converting that into a number, and then I can take that number and I can do computational mathematics on that number. Now, I believe that someday all radios will be direct sampling. We're seeing the speed of converters going up and the performance of converters going up. And the benefits uh, are such that I think we'll see uh, radios go in that direction. Now I want to talk a little bit about big SDR versus little SDR. See the little s? Uh, we've got a gray area where you can call things the SDRs that we wouldn't have called them. Uh, some people called a DSP superhead an SDR. You might see that. And I would call that a little s because you're, there, you're, you can do some limited things in software and the companies that uh, call it SDR may or may not do those limited things on an ongoing basis. So I would call big SDRs where you can do virtually everything in software and where you continue to enhance that software over time. That's the distinguishing way I would put it. So you can do, in true SDR, you can do all the modulation and demodulation is done in software. All the mixing, all the filtering done in software. Um, the digital signal processing in software, we, our control surface, the way we interface with the radio can be soft. Or we can mix it with hardware things too, like knobs. It doesn't necessarily mean no knobs, and I'll show you what I mean by that. We can add new features, like if we wanted, we added a new wideband noise blanker that I'll demo in a minute. That new feature needed a new knob. Well, how do you add that on a hardware system? You can't really do that easily. So we added a new feature and a new, con new two new controls to, to uh, set that up. And then you can clearly control it by software. Now we've had control, uh, software control radios using CAT for many, many years. That doesn't necessarily make it a complete one. But if you have all those together, I would say you have a, a big SDR, not a small SDR. Now let's talk about direct sampling benefits. The first one is because we eliminated all of those analog sections, all of them, 
we've gotten rid of the distortion and noise produced by those analog sections. They're not there anymore. Um, and therefore, we can have extremely high dynamic range in these receivers and transmitters. Um, we can also have real-time HD uh, spectrum displays. That means I can literally see below the noise floor. You can actually see signals you can't hear because the filter bandwidth of the spectrum display is narrower than the filter bandwidth that I use for my ears. We can have multiple receivers and wide bandwidth pan adapters. Why would you care about that? Well, I might want to be chasing a DX station on RIDI on more than one band or CW, and I might want to be decoding that on more than one band at once so it can hop from band to band. Well, I might want multiple receivers. I might want to listen to the DX station while I'm also listening to my receive frequency, my transmit frequency. Um, and I also want to be able to monitor multiple bands to watch for openings to see whether they're coming open. I can do digital signal processing at RF, literally at the speed of the RF signal. I can actually do mathematics on that, and that has some benefits. And I can have completely programmable capabilities from the antenna all the way to the audio and to my eyesight. So in terms of performance, uh, we've actually proven that by being at the top of the charts for several years in terms of uh, total dynamic range, which means the ability to hear weak signals in the presence of large signals. That's the simplest way to put it. Um, now, let me ask you another question. What if my radio were a server? I mentioned the radio server earlier. Well, at my house, my radio is a server. And that's where it is. The, uh, over to the right is a rack. And that in the middle is my 6700 and antenna control and power supply right there. I can roll that rack out. Um, and I can connect that server to SmartSDR to a Maestro, which is a new product from ours. I can actually use it on an a iPhone or an iPad uh, or, uh, or a Mac. It doesn't really care which one of these devices that I'm controlling the PC with. And I can do that across my home LAN or with the proper tools over the internet. Because this, the radio is, is a server. It naturally is a remote device. Now here's my home, new home station. Just built this out. And you can see that rack and roll out. That's a 12U 12, uh, 12 rack. And I just roll it out, work on the back of it, roll it back in. And the, you can see how clean the desk is there. I've got a maestro over there. And I have uh, the N1MM logger up on the screen there, ready to go. And even the logger is connected to the server. The logger talks over the Ethernet, my network, as a server. It's not physically connected with a cat port or anything like that. Now, if I get tired of the shack, then I can have a Mexican martini, as we call them, on the uh, on the the back deck on a beautiful day, which means if I like six meters, six meters is not open when I'm always in, when I'm in the shack, so I can go sit and wait for six meters to open or ten meters if it ever opens again. <laughs> so how do if if the radio is a server, then what if I had an application programming interface? Now I'm not going to explain this to you, but uh, the radio has a network connector. It has an Ethernet port on it. And there's a protocol that that radio talks over that Ethernet port, which you could actually read, like set frequency, 14.2 USB, and filter bandwidth. So you can, you can actually read that protocol over the network. If you sniff the network, you can read it. It's called Wireshark. You can sniff the network and read the protocol. And so everything that we do on the PC or on a Maestro or on an iPad can be done using that interface. And we've made that interface open. And I'm going to show you an application today that uses that open interface. So believe it or not, there are well over 100 developers that have, that, have downloaded that open interface. Now, some of them are just playing. They're just looking. Some of them are hams that are serious. Some of them are commercial companies that are serious and doing things. And I'll show you some of those. The first one, which I think is kind of cool, is uh, Marcus, DL8MRE, uh, learned about 
uh, our radios in December of last year. Uh, he previously was the chief information officer for Aldi, the grocery store chain. That was his day job for 15 years. He retired with a lot of money and said, I want to go build iOS apps for phones and so forth. And so he saw our radio and he said, I want to build an app for that. So let's demo that app. This is a demo version of it. I'm not actually connected okay, to it. Okay, English, you want to email Sierra, your 5928. Thank you. Papa Delta 2, Delta X, for my 5928. So I can touch tune on the, there. I can drag tune. I can bring up menus to do things. Bring up my transmitter power and so forth. And I can also go to the web. And these are the live spots, real live spots right now. And you see the spots, the spot plot in there? So I'm doing real time spots. And I'm doing it over a Wi Fi network. Now, if I had a radio in here, I could actually connect to the radio other than the, the demo mode. So, uh, Marcus built this app without ever talking to us. And he came to Austin uh, a few months ago and uh, sat down with us. And we said, this is great stuff. Let's come together and partner together. And that's now branded as Smart SDR, which is our brand for iOS. You can download on, that on the Apple Store. It will run on your iPhone and your iPad. And I believe you're running it, aren't you? Or yeah. Both. both. You're running both. And one license for multiple devices. Yeah. So here's, here's an example of a, a person in Germany who took our open source, our open API, built an application, made it work and made it available, and it is a powerful application that does virtually all the functionality of the radio. Also, there's a, I'm, I think I just skipped it, there's a native Mac client from Dogpart uh, software. Uh, DX Lab, how many of you are familiar with DX Labs? He's written a, a native interface that gets rid of cat, which is a nasty, cat is a nasty thing, you know, with com ports and all those kind of things. So he's gotten rid of it. There's no reason to have CAT if you program directly to our interface. Um, there's no reason to even have sound cards if you program directly to our interface. Uh, write log, which is a popular contest logger, has direct interface, including for the digital modes, going directly to the waveform interface. I just uh, saw G3WGV did a presentation yesterday uh, where he has a Flex 6500 and a Maestro, and he built his own console um, that uses a Raspberry Pi, I think it is, uh, inside, and, and he built this box because he wanted to have programmable controls for his radio. He did that using that same open API. We also demonstrated the ability to add digital modes to the radio on the fly, and we created an API for waveforms. Waveforms can be anything like D-Star is a waveform. Um, Fusion is a waveform. All of those things are waveforms. And so a programmer can actually develop a waveform, load it into the radio using a standard method, and it will pop up as a mode on your, you know, like just beside USB or CW, it'll pop up and it says D-Star. So that we use the D-Star, this dongle, here you plug it in the USB port in the back of the radio. When you plug it in, load the waveform in, then you have D-Star as a mode. Now, a commercial company wanted to put some capabilities uh, on the space station of tracking ships. Much like APRS for ships, there's something called AIS for ships. And it works similar to AP APRS in that it, it tells you the location of the ship, its ID, what it's carrying, some things like that, uh, uh, that you can identify the ship. The problem is it only works within li line of sight from the shore because they're VHF. Well, what happens when they're out from that? There are systems that do get, gather that data even before this system, but they were, it would take a week to process the data, so you had no real time. So they wanted real time. So on July 18th, Two Flex 6700Rs launched on SpaceX CRS-9. 
It was along with a new docking collar that they were going to put on the, the space station to allow them to dock some of the newer uh, capsules. And it was on a Dragon capsule. That's literally the, the unit being captured there on the space station. And on the left, you'll see the, the board up inside there. That's a 6700 main board from the 6700. And that's being uh, tested in the lab. The lower right is the unit actually installed and operational on the space station. And this is an illustration. See all the little purple dots here? Every one of those is a ship. Uh, now, they use the data in much, many, many ways, but this is just one illustration. You can see all the ships around the globe. So you, you can imagine you have semi-real time by the, the, the uh, space station going around. Now, all of these are just illustration about what if the radio is a server. There's so many different things. I have others, even ionosonic uh, sounders that a company has built an ionoson that sounds, you've ever seen the sweepers go by on, on the, that, that's a sounder. And so it plots the ionosphere. Now, one of the things that uh, I think is important is the design challenge to, is to manage complexity so that it isn't complicated. These radios have tremendous complexity in it. So how do you make that uncomplicated? And that's one of the things that we've tried to do. Now, would you say that's complicated? Does that look like anybody's shack that, that I know? <laughs> yeah. We've all gotten shacks like that. That is K9CT. He's a well-known contester and DXer. And that's his SO2R setup before and after conversion. See the difference? That's a single operator, two radio. You can operate two bands at once with that that station. See everything that went away in that? All the cables? Do you think there were some ground loops that went away? Some, some problems that went away when you took all those cables out? And here's the front of that exact setup. You'll notice he has his loggers. That's N1MM loggers set up and he's got his antenna rotators and all that kind of stuff on the two screens. He has a maestro, flex radio maestro here. There's the 6700. It's right at his keyboard. So you can see operationally it's very effective. And here's what it looks like. Um, he, it's a multi-two station. It's two, band, it's two bands, one band on the right, left, one in the right. Uh, so you have four operators on two bands. And they won the U.S. multi-two uh, ARRL DX with that. And Ward Silver, uh, in the latest QST that just came out, was at that station. He has a sidebar in the, the article about review of Maestro that he wrote about his experience. He was a first time user, just dropped down and used it for the first time. Um, also, CR3W, uh, they won the multi multi high power a couple, couple weeks, last weekend, wasn't it? I think it was last weekend or two weekends ago in Ready. And this was the setup uh, with, they did half of the contacts. They, and that contest were done on the 6700. They had some other stations, but half, they did 2,400 contacts out of 5,600 uh, on that, that setup. So uh, one of the things that was a debate for a long time is SDRs don't need knobs. Radios don't need knobs or they need knobs. And so actually SDRs do need knobs in certain, in certain applications. They don't in others. And one of those applications is contesting uh, or being a, a D, actually being at a DX location or being uh, chasing DX. Chasing DX, not so much, but being DX, you might need some knobs. And so uh, we set out to, to try to do that in a way that really was effective by interviewing about uh, 15 major contesters and asking them what they like and what they didn't like about their current setups. And we actually ended up having K9CT and 403 Alpha help us design the user interface, the, the, the physical controls, to be exactly what you need, no more, no less, really in a contesting or a DXing kind of situation. And we wanted those controls to be, to basically do one thing well and not five things so that you don't end up in straight mode. So that was how the right hand was designed here. But we didn't want to lose the graphical, physical, you know, the high definition screen that you have in, in smart SDR. So we wanted the best of both worlds. So that's an 80 inch touch screen. Um, 
uh, IPS display like you would have on a tablet. And uh, we wanted a rem we all not only wanted to work in the station, but we also wanted remote. You saw me using it out on my my uh, deck. And really, it's a, it's smartest DR plus knobs and buttons. It replaces the PC. You do not need a PC uh, with this device. It replaces it. Now, if you want to run a logger or digital mode, you still need a PC, just like you would always, but you know, not for running the radio. It works on both Wi-Fi and Ethernet. You can pick it up and you walk around the house with it. I can take it to the kitchen. I can take it out in the back and operate. Or I can plug it in with an Ethernet port. It operates on AC, DC, or battery. If you've ever owned one of the uh, battery uh, power packs for your phones or your laptops, you ever seen those? They're, they're about the size of a cell phone. You can pop one of those in the back of the radio, plug its USB port in. I've run as many as five hours uh, of operation on a, one of those batteries, a 12 amp hour. And so it's very simple controls. The things you use for slice A, which is the same as VFOA or VFOB, are right there at your fingertips, your audio, uh, filter bandwidth, et cetera. Now you can use it in a lot of different places. These are customer pictures I picked up off of our user community. Somebody mounted it in their car, ready to go there. It has a Visa mount, VESA, to a RAM mount, so you can put it in your, your vehicle. Uh, you can see it down here. This is a uh, Summits on the Air. Guy took it to Summits on the Air and working out uh, in the, somewhere with it. And one guy said he wanted to work IARU HF 2016 in the shade. He wor it worked the entire event in the shade tree in the back. Had a beautiful day. Why sit inside when you can work outside? And the radio is inside in his shack. Now, Glenn Johnson, any of you ever heard of W0GJ? Any of you know him? He came and spoke last year. Uh, he, I think he was talking about K1N last year, um, Navasa. Uh, this year, uh, he and Craig went to uh, Palmyra, which is literally in the middle of the Pacific. Any of you work Palmyra? A few of you? It was probably pretty hard to work from, from here. It was easy for me, but... Uh, so they took two 6500s and two Maestros to Palmyra, and one of the interesting things they said was on 160 meters, at total, in 80 meters, they had really weak signals out there, uh, right at the noise floor and below the noise floor. And they were able to use the Maestro, they would see a signal just kind of creep up out of the noise, and they would double tap on the signal, work them. They'd see another one come up out here, double tap. And so Glenn called it whack-a-mole. They were able to actually, <laughs> you'd whack this one and whack that one, and he said we would have never known those stations. They were working stations on 160 and 80. They would have never known were there uh, because of the display. And you can see what, you know, these are two pileups, TX6G. You can see where the, <laughs> the DX quit transmitting, right? Look here. There's the DX. This is RIDI. That's CW. This is RIDI. And you can, there's the station he's talking to. So easy to see. And by the way, if I come over here and I can drag this and I can go back in time for hours, I can, I can literally have a time machine. In fact, in the latest review, uh, Ward Silver said in QST that just came out, it's terrific for situational analysis, awareness. That's what's going on on the band. You can just instantly see what's going on on the band. It just changes everything. So then another thing, it's really all about the software. If it's a software-defined radio, it's all about the software. One of the things that we did was uh, we ran into Dave Hirschberger, who had developed an algorithm for controlled envelope single sideband. What that means is, is that I'm going to uh, literally look forward in time uh, at, the, at the envelope of the signal and process, process that signal in such a way that I can increase my output average power by almost 3 dB, 2.5 dB, uh, without distortion. Now, you can do that. You can increase power with some processors, but that not without distortion. You know, you've heard splatter on the bands. I'm talking about increasing it. It's like doubling your power without distortion. And this, we were able to implement that in partnership with him and put it into practice. He had theory. 
we put it into practice, and that came out as a, just a capability in the radio. So if you want to get punched through on the, D, on the DX, double your power without distortion. Now, another thing we did, I mentioned wideband noise blanking. Uh, any of you have impulse noise like fences or you know, power lines or things like that that create impulses? Well, we created a wideband noise blanker. What we do is we look at the entire RF spectrum of HF all at once. And when we do that, we can actually find the leading edge of a pul that pulse and we can subtract it in a linear fashion or near linear fashion. And, and that does amazing things for you. Here's a demo. We were cool last night. We were in the high 40s last night, about 48. So we're getting into the fall weather. And uh, some places in Vermont hit the mid 40s last night. And then we warm up during the day. So we'll turn it on. The fall is on its way. Uh, some of the leaves are beginning now. to show a little bit of color. Nothing See it? Yeah, it'll be another couple of weeks before we have any See the difference? Out there for the, <laughs> He's going to turn it off. Leaf watchers to come up and watch all the foliage here in, in Vermont. So See, there was a signal to... right here just a minute ago. <laughs> just a second ago. That's 20 dB of improvement for a long, long time in the noise floor. So that's a capability. The radios, would, uh, you know, this ship two, or two years after the initial radios, and suddenly that capability dealt with a download was on the radio. That's what I mean by software defined. Uh, also, we can have brick wall filters. With SDRs, you literally, like on sideband, if you looked at the filters, they're vertical like this. So you can take the, the knob and shift the filter. And if you've got QRM, you just move it a little bit, and it just disappears. If you have CW, narrow CW filters, they don't ring like, a, like the, uh, the crystal filters do because they are perfectly linear linear in phase filters. So you can have a 50 hertz filter and they, it doesn't ring like it would on uh, the others. And now there is a trade-off between latency, the time between the receiver and your ear, and the sharpness of the filter. It's physics. And so we've made the capability of actually having sliders that you can trade off between whether I want the shortest latency or I want the steepest filter skirts, and you have four different steps. So we, if you're in a contest, you might opt for lower latency. If you're really trying to dig out a weak signal, you might opt for the short, you know, in the presence of other signals, you might opt for, sh for sharper filters. So we've given that capability. That just came out in, in the last few weeks, that capability of varying that. The other thing is I can have seamless everything. You saw those cables go away? Well, you can't, you know, with other radios, you have to have all those cables to do digital modes if you want, you know, run digital mode, uh, RIDI or PSK and all those things. Uh, this, this is CW Skimmer. Some of you familiar with CW Skimmer? So what if I could run Skimmer on four different bands at once with 192 kilohertz on all four bands? And what if, with a single mouse click, I could QSY and transmit in an instant any signal on those four bands. Do you think that would give you the ability to chase, chase contacts, right? So that literally, uh, you can click here, and, uh, or you can click on that right there, and it will QSY, and your transmitter is on that frequency. And that's with no wires. Um, and you can even have it on the same computer or a different computer. So the extra Equipment and cables to run skimmer or any digital modes. How much do you need? None. Zilch. Zero. You don't need anything to run those modes. So here's a setup for CQ Worldwide with uh, two copies of skimmers on two different bands. You can see a skimmer on each side. In the middle, you can see Smart SDR logger right there. And if you use write log, it, it populates this the, uh, the guy's call sign into right log with that click. Click, populate, work. Pretty cool. Here's a ready setup, AI9T. So you can see he's got N1MM logger here, uh, MTTY, two-tone. You can run both MTTY and two-tone, all of those things. And you can, uh, you can do that SO2R right now, too, with one radio. So that's kind of what's been going on recently. There's a lot more. I cut a hundred and something slides down to 75, and I got a few more to go. So what's next? Well, as you start to thinking about remoting things, either in the house or outside the house, you really need to be able to 
connect your amplifiers, your step IR, your, all of those kind of things. So uh, in the past, we had to use only DDUtil, which is a utility that runs on a PC that allows you to connect all these peripherals. Uh, we're testing right now USB to serial and USB to BCD, USB to parallel cables that are readily available uh, that would normally plug into the PC. We have two USB ports on the back of the radio. You can plug a hub in, USB hub, and plug as many of these devices as you could normally use and control multiple devices off of one port, which is cleans it, further cleans things up. You know, when you think about it, you have multiple devices. So that's in testing as of this weekend. We'll be out in version 1.10. The next thing is, is that the 6000 series is built from the get-go for remote. Um, because it has Ethernet communications, it's by definition remotable. Uh, and we've designed the protocols for very low bandwidth, both the display capabilities and the audio. We use... Uh, data compression on those in order to reduce the bandwidth. And uh, you can, uh, today there are people running these radios using virtual private networks. Um, and uh, one of the guys in my presentation yesterday had his uh, iPad that he was running his home station from the, from the other room we were in, and he said there's virtually no latency uh, operating his station. We have customers that are operating all over the world, their home stations, uh, using VPNs. Now, it would be nice to get rid of the VPN, so we're working toward full native remoting, where you basically just plug it in and it's remote. Uh, and that's, that's the goal. The next thing that we're working toward is we've had a lot of contesters say, well, we'd really like to put multiple clients on one radio. I've got a 6500 or a 6700, I want to have two operators. I have four receivers on a 6500, eight on a 6700. Why not allow them to each have uh, receivers dedicated to them? So that's a, that's a capability. Well, what if I'm operating and I want to give my friend access to my radio while I'm using it? You could actually do that remotely. So uh, some of those, or I want to leave my station running. I want to take my iPad and I want to be out here with my iPad and have my station running, I can run in there. I can have both of those operating at the same time. So those are a few things, just a few peeks at what we're working on uh, going forward using the radio as a server. So uh, we're having a lot of fun. So I still feel like that kid. The reason I do is because if you can think it, you can kind of do it these days. It's because it's software, you don't always have to pull out a soldering iron. Obviously, we do have soldering irons. But uh, it's amazing. We have so many ideas, and our customers have so many ideas, we don't have enough engineers to, to do all of those ideas. That's the biggest problem. We're, it's frustrating because there's so many things we can do with this technology. I'll give you just a hint. What if you had uh, thousands of receivers and every one of those receivers had date and time stamped information coming to them. Do you think you could do something with that information if you had, you know, people QRMing, <laughs> you know, deliberate QRM? You might be able to find them, right? Something like that. Or you might be able to use the best signal to noise from multiple receivers. Or you might be able to listen to your own signal from some somewhere else. So there are lots of things you can do when the radios are served. So anyway, um, do we have time for a couple of questions? No time? We have run over, I'm afraid. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, I just want to, uh, to thank you, Gerald, and I'm sure that I echo the thoughts of everyone here. That's been an extremely uh, informative um, uh, talk to us this afternoon, and thank you very, very much. Thank you.